if you brought your Bible with you, if you would turn with me, please, to John chapter number 11. John, John chapter number 11. If you don't have your Bible with you, they will be putting it up on the screen. But, but in John chapter number 11, we see that there's this guy named Lazarus who has died. Lazarus is completely dead. He has completely died. And, and it's weird to see how this plays into Jesus' voyage and journey to the cross. It's a little bit weird to see how, how whatever was going on with Lazarus would play a role in Jesus and his trip to the cross. But we're going to look here in a minute and see how it played a role in Jesus' life. But Jesus was very close to Martha, to Mary, which were Lazarus' sisters. And he was very close to Lazarus. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, it says that Jesus wept. This is, this is the scripture that, that we can all get right. Right? A lot of scripture gets misquoted. That scripture right there, you cannot misquote. Jesus wept, period. You got it. Like, like if somebody ever asks you, do you know your Bible? Yes, Jesus wept. Okay, you get an A plus. You know it. Like, you know something in there. But, but Jesus was really close to Lazarus, Martha, Mary. But Lazarus has died. And Jesus shows up in verse number 17. And it says, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Four days. I think it is safe to say that Lazarus is dead. I, I think it's safe to say that Jesus is a little later than they would have wanted him to be. Don't you think if they wanted Lazarus to live that Jesus getting there after he's dead is late? Jesus is four days late, at least. Some of y'all, Jesus here is your spirit animal. You're like, church starts at 10, I'm getting there at 10.30 because I'm trying to be like Jesus, right? <laughs> Jesus was late, I'm gonna be late. Try to be like Jesus, but when it says he gets there late, now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And here we start to see how it plays into Jesus' journey to the cross. Because Jerusalem is where Jesus entered on Palm Sunday, which is what we're going to celebrate next week. And he's on his way to Jerusalem to enter in to start what would ultimately lead him to the cross and to the resurrection. But he makes a pit stop in Bethany. How many are thankful that Jesus will make a pit stop? Yes. That he'll stop off in your situation on the way to do what he's really come to do. So Jesus stops in Bethany. It's two miles away from Jerusalem. And it says that many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you would have been here, my brother would not have died. No hello, no how you been, no it's beautiful weather that we're having today. No, just where were you? Am I the only one that's ever had a desperate moment like that? A time of desperation where, where it was like, yeah, we have our pretty prayers. We have our, you know, Father God, we thank you for today. We have our introductions. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Our Father who art in heaven. We have all these pretty prayer introductions. But I don't know if there's anybody else besides myself that's ever just been desperate. Just cut to the chase. Hey, I'll get to the formalities later, but Jesus, I need help. Where were you? What's going on? This is craziness. She runs out and she says this to Jesus. And she says, I love this though. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Somebody's in an even now moment. You're in a moment where you don't know what's going to happen, but even now, God is still God and God is still good. You don't have the answer, but even now, God can still do it. You don't understand it, but even now, God will still do it. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you 
believe this. See, Martha and Mary are believing for something. That's the, that's the first step is you got to believe for something. Some of us aren't seeing anything because we're not believing for anything. We're talking about a lot of things, but we're not believing for anything. They were believing for something. They were believing for their brother not to die, but to live. They were believing that Jesus was going to show up and do something about their situation. That he was going to show up and heal their brother. And I don't know everybody in this room or joining us online, but I know that almost all of us are believing for something. It may, it may not be for your brother to, to get healed. Maybe it is for your brother to get healed. But, but many of us, myself included, have had a moment where it's like, God, what is happening? God, what is going on? Where are you? Why didn't you do something about this? God, why didn't you handle this? God, why didn't you answer this? I don't know what it is for you. It might be a financial situation. It might be a physical situation, a health situation, a relational situation. Some of you, it might be sitting right next to you. Don't look at them. It might be your marriage. It might be your children. I don't know what it is for you. But Jesus waited four days before he ever even showed up. He found out about Lazarus' sickness, and then he was like, I think I'm going to wait two more days before I go to do anything about that. Because it wasn't time yet. It looked like it was time because he's dying. But Jesus said it was not time yet. It's not time. It's not time. So we get so wrapped up in our minds about timing. We always think that, that we know the timing. That we have the timing figured out. Because everything is about timing. In all sports, it's about timing. In football, it's the timing of the route for the, for the wide receiver. In, in baseball, it's the timing of your swing. In basketball, it's the timing of the pass to hit somebody when they're open in the perfect place. It's all about timing. When we cook things, it's about timing. If you don't take it out in time, it's burnt. If you take it out too soon, it's not done. It's timing. It's timing. And, and if there's something in your life that you're believing for and it's not happening, people in church will tell you, well, it's just not time yet. And it's so comforting, but in our hearts, we're like, no, but it is time. It is time. Like, I need it right now. I'm, I'm like, it's not time for you to find somebody yet. You got to work on you. I've been working on me for 60 years. When you think somebody's going to be here? Am I that big of an issue that I need an entire lifetime to work on me? God, I've been working, putting in overtime because it's timing. And we're always talking about timing. But I want to talk to you today on the subject, and you want to write this down if you're taking notes. Timing isn't everything. Timing isn't everything. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for today. And I just thank you that in the midst of the unplanned and the unexpected that you are still God. And I pray that you would meet with us today, that you would help those of us who, who came out today to hear from you and to see you spoken through your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to apply what is spoken today to our lives. Help us to see and to hear from you. And I thank you for it in Jesus name. Amen. Now, have you ever noticed how you can remember some of the most random things? Like, you, like, like in relationships, not just dating relationships, even friendships with your family. Like if you think back over your life, there are random things that have happened that you can remember, right? Like random, like random stuff. I mean, I have a friend who can tell me when I hurt his feelings in sixth grade. I'm like, bro, let it go. Like we are maybe... 20, I don't know how many years, I'm not going to add it up. You get to a certain point, you stop counting, you know what I'm talking about? So, so I'm like, just let it go. Like, you remember, though, the most random things. And I remembered uh, a couple weeks ago, thinking about, you know, my, mine and my wife's dating anniversary was coming up, which we keep, still keep track up because we've only dated, been dating for about four or five years now. So I was thinking about when we were dating, and I remembered something random. And it was the first time that we baked chocolate chip cookies, now, I don't know how long we had been together, but I know it had been a long time because, and we were serious because when you first start dating somebody, you're eating twigs, right? 
Like you're eating leaves and, and lead, kale. Like you're eating all that kind of stuff. But then once you get serious, it's like cheeseburgers and pizza and chocolate chip cookies and cake, right? Because you're like not so worried about it anymore. And, and them thinking that you just like to eat everything in sight. Maybe I'm speaking from my own personal experience and not even really talking about you. I don't know. If you can relate, take it. If not, it's okay. But that's how I am. It's like I'm starting out small, right? I don't want to think they're going to have to, like, feed, you know, this pig for the rest of their lives. I just want it to be, like, simple. So, but we're eating chocolate chip cookies, and I remember thinking in this moment, I'm going to marry this girl. I'm going to marry this girl because chocolate chip cookies are my love language. You can cuss me out, but if you give me chocolate chip cookies, we're good. Okay, you can call a meeting with me and come in and say all these things that you don't like and all these problems you have. But if you bring me chocolate chip cookies, we good. It's okay. Like, I'll, you know, I'll let it go because chocolate chip cookies are my love language. It's the sixth love language. See, y'all thought there were only five. The sixth one is chocolate chip cookies, and that's mine. I love chocolate chip cookies. But I'm not even going to lie to you. We were not making these from scratch. It was the pull and bake kind. You know what I mean? Like, you just buy them in the bag, and you peel them, and you throw them on the thing, and you... Okay, so I knew in this moment, too, that she was my one and only because she said that she liked her chocolate chip cookies to be a little gooey, right? I don't like well-done cookies. They shouldn't be well-done. If you make them well-done and people tell you they're good, they're lying to you. (laughs) Cookies need to be gooey. And it's an art, though, because if it's too done, they're gross, but if they're too gooey, salmonella. So you got to find, like... (laughs) the middle, middle ground. And, and the secret to the peel and bake cookies and making them perfect is putting them on a pizza stone. See, y'all don't know anything about this. I'm about to teach you. You get them on a pizza stone because it makes the top, you got to cook them longer than the suggested, suggested recommendation, but it gets the top a little bit like just a nice crisp, but then the rest of it is just completely soft. It's, it's, it's perfect. So we put them on the pizza stone Put them in there, and about 10 minutes later, I was like, hey, you think those cookies are ready? She said, not yet. Now I'm a guy. So to me, that means I need to go check, right? <laughs> She's like, not yet. I said, okay. I sat for like five seconds, you know, like I am actually took into consideration what she said. And then I got up, and I walked to the kitchen, and I, and I look in there, and I'm like, oh, yeah, they're done. They're done. Like, I love you but I don't love anybody enough to let them ruin my chocolate chip cookies. So I look in, I'm like, okay, yeah, these are done. So I pull them out, I turn off the oven, I let them cool for about two to three minutes, finish finish their little bacon thing on the pizza stone, and and then I come back in and I check on them, and they were nowhere near done. They were salmonella, you know? Like, they were nowhere near done. So I put them back in the oven, I turn the oven back on, and I let them go for like another five minutes, came back, took them back out, let them cool, And I'm like, okay, these look amazing, right? These look amazing. So I go back in. I take the cookies with me to Nicole, and and, and we sit down to eat them, and they're disgusting because they're chewy. And I don't mean like a good chewy. I mean like you get your steak well done chewy. You know, just like, like it's not supposed to be this way, right? It's disgusting. And Nicole's like, I don't know what happened. Like, you know, we left them in the amount of time, and so I fessed up because I felt bad. And I was like, listen, I took them out. I did all this. And she said, I told you when you asked if they were done, I told you not yet. And I was like, I know. But when I looked at them, it looked like it was time to take them out. And she said, but I told you not yet. And I said, I know that, but I made an executive decision. If you're going to marry me, get used to it. I said, these cookies look done. See, she got called into work today, so I can say whatever I want to. She's not even here to rebut it. So, so I'm, like, I'm like, I thought they were done, and I took them out. And she said, well, the reason I told you not yet was because I knew that they wouldn't be ready yet. And the truth is, they weren't ready yet. See, a lot of times in our situation, we look at it, and it looks like it's time for Jesus to do something, but he's up there saying, not yet. We, we look at it, and we think it's time for us to make a move. I'm making moves in 2019, right? I'm making moves. This is my year to make moves. And Jesus is saying, not yet, but we make a move anyways and it's not done. It's salmonella. And so then we try to fix it, and, it, and it's too messed up to be able to, to fix on our own. And so then we bring it to God, and he's like, I told you, not yet, but it's okay. I love you enough. I'm still going to work on it. But now it's going to take even longer than what you expected. See, sometimes God will say, not yet. 
Not yet. And that's the first thing I need you to write down is, is some of us, he is saying, not yet. When it came to Lazarus' sickness and being healed, Jesus said, not yet. Not yet, because it says that he arrived in verse 17, and Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. For four days. Now, you would think that Jesus' timing would have been a little better than this. You would think that Jesus' timing would have been before Lazarus died, right? You would not think that Jesus' timing is after Lazarus died, because when he's dead, he's done. So you would think that his timing would have been before the moment that Lazarus died, but Jesus waited until after he was dead. See, when somebody is dying and you want them to live, you think that something needs to be done before they die. If your business is dying and you want it to live, you want something done Before it dies. If your relationship is dying and you want something done to live, you need something done before it dies. If if the thing of your hope, some of us, are our hope is dying. And we're like, God, I need you to do something now because my hope is dying. And you think it needs to be done before it dies. You think that God needs to show up in your timing because you look at it and it's dying. And we think that the answer always needs to come before it's dead. Because once it's dead, it's too late. But when Jesus found out about Lazarus' sickness, he waited two more days before he ever even left where he was. Because it wasn't time yet. It wasn't time. And Mary and Martha thought that Jesus' time would have been before Lazarus died. That's why they sent for Jesus. They said, Jesus, Lazarus is dying. We don't want him to die. We know you don't want him to die. So we need you to come now and to do something before he dies. Because in our minds, when it's dead, it's done. So we think that if something is dying, that that's going to be the end. But Jesus shows up, I love this, after Lazarus has been dead for four days, and he says, guess what? With me, there's no such thing as too late. With me, it's never too late. With me, there's just not yet. You think I'm too late, but the truth is I just had to say not yet. And and this messes with us. It's hard for us to grab hold of. It's hard for us to take to heart because because the, the fact is just because you think it's time does not mean that it is. Just because you think it's time does not mean that it is. And I get it. You think that you're right 99% of the time, and you might be. Like if you're like me, you're 90, you're 99% of the time you're right. 99.9% of the time. If you're like me, if you're not like me, maybe less than that. But like I'm I'm right. 99.9% of the time. But just because you may be right 99.9% of the time, it still does not change the fact that just because you think it's time, it does not mean it is. Just because you don't want to wait doesn't mean that you don't have to wait. We get our wants messed up with God's plan. We get our wants messed up with God's agenda and what God is wanting to do. Well, I don't want to wait for that, but God says you need to wait for that. So since we don't want to, we don't, and then we wonder why everything's in disarray. Jesus is walking around. He's saying, hey, I know that you think that it's time, but not yet. I know that you want it to be time, but not yet. I know that you don't want to have to wait, but you need to wait. You need to wait. There's, there's moments in our lives where, where God will send a divine delay. See, the beauty is that, that we may have to wait, but a waiting season is never a wasted season. The moments that you're waiting, it's never wasting because God will show up and he'll send a divine delay where he's going to come through with what you were believing for, but he's not going to do it in the time frame that you wanted. So since it's not in the time frame that we wanted, we think that God has forgotten about what we were wanting to see. Since God doesn't do it when we wanted him to do it, we don't appreciate it. We don't appreciate it or we don't even recognize what he's doing because he's not doing it when we wanted him to do it. 
So we miss out on what God was wanting to do. See, like, it's like, God, I prayed for this, this job that I applied for. I believed that this was going to be the time that I got the job that I needed to provide for my family so that we stopped living in this way that we've been having to live. And I felt like this was the job, but then they told me I didn't get the job. And so now I'm struggling because I feel like God's forgotten about what I was believing for. I'm struggling because I feel like God has forgotten about what I was needing in my life. But God has not forgotten. He just had something better. And he had to pass up that opportunity so that he could get you to what he really had planned for your life. We put way too much clout in in when. We put way too much care in timing. We care way too much about when it's going to happen. We care way too much about how God's going to do it. We care way too much about when we want God to do it and the way that he's going to do it and the timing that he's going to do it. But God has his own time. Tell somebody he's got his own time. He's got his own time. And when we put so much energy in the when, we miss the what. When we put so much energy in when he's going to do it, We miss what he's actually wanting to do. See, if you think about it in your life right now, we're all believing for something. We all are expecting God to do something a certain way, right? We have in our hearts the way that we're expecting him to do things. If you need a financial breakthrough, you have how you expect for him to do it. Maybe you expect to get the promotion on your job. Maybe you expect to actually win the lottery. Maybe you expect for somebody that you don't know in a far distant land to to die that you've never met, but they leave you an inheritance because they liked your name. (laughs) Maybe you expect it, like they looked at their family tree and they were like, that name is cool. I'm leaving $5 million for that person. Like we have how we expect for it to happen. Maybe you're wanting to find somebody to marry and you're expecting for it to happen a certain way. God, I I know that I'm just gonna walk into this place and everybody that's there is just gonna part. And I'm gonna stand there like this. I'm gonna flick my hair back and I'm gonna walk and he's gonna have his hand out waiting for me. Like I'm expecting things to happen. Maybe it's like, you know what, Easter Sunday, we're having two services. I'm gonna be at both because I know everybody comes to church on Easter Sunday. So I'm gonna have a chance to meet somebody that I've never met before in two services. Best believe I'm gonna have my Sunday best on because I'm meeting my spouse on Easter Sunday. The bride of Christ is meeting my groom. On Easter Sunday, we got two chances. Ain't a bad idea. Listen, I'm just saying. <laughs> but but we, have, we have figured out in our mind when we think God's going to do it, how he's going to do it. But God will do it in the most unexpected time. That's why the next time you go to Walmart, maybe look in the mirror before you leave the house. Because you never know. You never know when God's going to show up. And when he's going to bring the thing that you've been believing for. You, you got the win in your head, but it's causing you to miss the what? You didn't know that it was going to be when you went to Walmart, but that's what God had for you. But because you walk in there looking all janky, you miss out on the moment. And now God's like, got to rework things. And how do I get them here for Elevation Point Church Easter Sunday, right? Because that's what you had in your mind. So when we focus so much on when God's going to do it, we miss what he's actually going to do. And the problem with having made up in our mind when God needs to do everything is 99% of the time, it doesn't happen that way. 99% of the time, God does it completely different. And one of the greatest causes of anxiety and stress and worry and discouragement is unmet expectations. Where God did not do what we expected him to do the way we expected him to do it. God did not do what we expected him to do when we expected him to do it. And so we get all out of sorts. And we start, we start losing our mind Because we're trying to figure out why is God not doing what he said that he would do? Why is he not doing it when he said that he would do it? We have to become okay with not yet. You have to become okay with not yet. And then we also have to learn how to avoid people that are living for self-comfort. So the next thing I need you to see is that some people in your life are living for self-comfort. They say they're there for you. 
but they're living out of self-comfort. It said in verse number 19, many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. Many Jews had come to comfort them. See, on the surface, this is nice, right? On the surface, this is amazing. Who does not want to be comforted? In a difficult time. If somebody that you love died, who would not want to be comforted in that moment? On the surface, it looks amazing. But you got to realize that just because somebody says that they're there for you does not mean that they really are. Some of the people that have been telling you, I'm there for you, I got your back, I'll always be here, are really there for themselves. And they're just trying to see what they can get out of the situation. They're trying to see what they can find in the situation. They're not really there to comfort you. They're there to take advantage of your situation to make it better for themselves. They show up and they say, listen, we're here to comfort you. It says straight up, it says they had come to comfort Martha and Mary for the loss of their brother. You ever wonder how somebody can be in your life for one moment, but then they're gone the next? How they're there for you, they got your back. I mean, they're, they're, they're your prayer partner, right? I'm praying with you, I'll call you anytime. Call me any time of day, I don't care, I'll pray with you. And then you look up and they're gone. And it's like, what happened? They didn't need you anymore. They didn't need you anymore. They got what they needed. And so... Because they weren't really there for you. They weren't really there to comfort you. They were there to get whatever they needed. They have no loyalty to you. They have loyalty to themselves and whatever they can go to to get what they need. They don't have loyalty to you. They have loyalty to a feeling. Some people just like to feel like they're doing something good. They're not doing anything good, but they want to feel like they're doing something good. I can live like the devil. I can live like hell. But if I show up and do something nice for somebody, then I've done my part and I can go do whatever I want. And they comfort you in those moments, but then you look up and they're gone. These people show up in verse number 19 to comfort Martha and Mary, but they were not really there to comfort Martha and Mary. They were there on another agenda. They were there to get close to the situation. So you got a lot of nosy people in your life. You got a lot of nosy people that don't really care two rips about you, but they want to know everything going on in your life. That's why you have nine, that's why you have 9,000 Facebook friends and two friends in real life. Because they're nosy. They're nosy. I used to care about my friend list. I used to want it to be big, and then I'm like, you know what? I don't even care anymore. Because these people, they don't really know me. They don't want to know me. They want to know what I put out here. So if I put something real, they're going to be gone. You want the people in your life speaking into your life and comforting you who can actually handle the junk that you're going to deliver. Who can actually be there in the good, the bad, the ugly, the confusing, and all of these situations. Stop finding comfort in nosy people. You're only bound to get more hurt. And the truth is, too, nosy people never give you good advice. The advice that nosy people give you is only going to get you further and further and further into a problem, into a situation. See, they didn't care about Martha and Mary. They just wanted to be there because they knew Jesus was close to Martha and Mary. And they wanted to get close to the situation. They were enamored with it. They didn't care about them. They wanted to find out more. And I'll prove it to you, because if you look at verse number 45, it says, Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. That's awesome. It's awesome, because some people are real. But verse 46, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Verse 53, so from that day on, they plotted to take his life. The comforters in verse 19 became the plotters in verse 53. The ones who showed up to comfort Martha and Mary in verse 19, by the time they got to 53, they were plotting. See, there's people in your life that will comfort you when you're down that don't really want to see you healed. 
There's people in your life that when, I mean, when you are down and it's awful and you just, you're just trying, you're grasping for air. You're just trying to find a, a glimmer of hope. They'll be there, but they don't really want to see you healed. See, they showed up to comfort, but their real agenda was to plot. Their real heart was to plot. Beware of people who show up when you're waiting, but leave you when you get what you've been waiting for. In the moment when you, you, you don't have it, in the moment when you're struggling, they're there for you. But the moment that you actually get what you've been praying for and they're still in their current state, they're gone. Because misery loves company. And so there's people who will only gravitate to you when you're in a difficult moment. That's why you got to stop telling everybody your business. And I get it. I understand it. Because listen, I'm the type that... that I, I, I've internalized my whole life. So when I get to a moment where I feel like I can't handle it, I try to find somebody to talk to. Because it's not healthy to internalize. But you have to choose who you talk to. And when I say you have to choose, I don't mean you. I mean you got to let the Holy Spirit speak into your life and guide you. Just because you're in a difficult moment doesn't mean that you stop listening to the Holy Spirit. When you get in that difficult moment, that's when you say, I, I need somebody's help. I need somebody who's been there, somebody who has wisdom, somebody who I can go to. And I need you, God, to direct me through the Holy Spirit to who I should go to. Because you can't tell everybody your business. You can't tell them. Everybody's willing to listen. But very few are willing to stay. So we have to avoid these nosy people. They show up and they're like, you know what? We want to comfort you, Martha and Mary. But internally inside, in their heart, they were being used by the enemy to plot to get Jesus to the cross and to begin his journey to the cross. And they show up to help, but they end up plotting. And Martha is surrounded by these people who don't really care about her. They don't really want her to see what she's been believing for. And she doesn't see what she was believing for. Isn't that crazy? Like, I mean, you realize Lazarus died. She was believing for Lazarus to live. Lazarus died. But even after he died, she still had faith. She still had faith. And this is easier said than done. Because when Jesus doesn't do it in our time frame, we think that he's not going to do it. It's way easier said than done. It is so easy, I'll acknowledge this, for me to stand up here on a Sunday morning and tell you to believe, to keep the faith. I mean, we have our vision Sunday. Our whole mission is just believe. And it's so easy for me to stand up here and say that. But what do you do when what you were believing for doesn't happen and it's too late? What do you do? Because when Jesus found out, and in John 11, verse 4, when he first found out that Lazarus was sick, Jesus literally said, look it up in your Bible, John eleven four. 4, he literally said, this sickness will not end in death. This sickness will not end in death. Guess what happened? Lazarus died. This sickness will not end in death. And then Lazarus died. What do you do? When Jesus said one thing, but something else happens. What do you do when God's spoken something into your life and then the exact opposite happens? What do you do? This sickness will not end in death. Sorry, Jesus. Like, gotcha. Finally got you. All my life I've been trying to get you. I finally got you, Jesus. Because you said Lazarus wouldn't die. Lazarus died. Like, I'm looking at him right now. I'm pretty sure, four days old, in the tomb, I'm pretty sure he's dead. If it looks like a dead person, and it smells like a dead person, it's dead person. It's dead. Four days late, Jesus shows up. Mind you, he's on the way to the cross. He's on the way to Jerusalem to enter in, to be crucified, rise again. He stops in Bethany, and Lazarus has been died for four days. Yes. 
are you going to tell him, Lazarus? Like, are you, who's, who's telling him that he was wrong? Like, because who, who, I don't know if he's ever been wrong before. I don't know how Jesus is going to handle it. So are you going to be the one that's going to tell Jesus, like, hey, I think you're losing it? Like, <laughs> you're, lo- you're over 30 now, so I, I don't know if you're, you know, you, I don't know if you still got it. I, I, you might have lost it. Which is not true, because I'm turning 30 this year, best years ahead, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it's like, who are you gonna, who's going to tell him that he was wrong? Who's going to tell him? He said, the sickness will not end in death. Who's telling Jesus that Lazarus has died? Jesus, you said that you said that, that relationship would not die, but it's dead. Jesus, you said that the chance of my children serving you would not die, but it's dead. Jesus, you said that, that what I was believing for would not die, but it's dead. Anybody ever had a time in your life where you knew that God said something, but the opposite happened. Jesus, you said this, but it's over. God, you said that my chance of having children would not die, but it's, it's dead. It's dead. Because we think that stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So if it's dead, that's the end of the story. But the amazing thing about Jesus is he has an encore. <laughs> Jesus has an encore. He's like a great preacher. He's got two closings. It's like, you thought that was the closing? No, I got something else for you. I got another closing. There's a movie coming out called uh, Avengers Endgame. Avengers Endgame, I think. And I I like the Avengers movie. I'm not like a hardcore nerd. Like, I don't see, I haven't seen all of them. There's like 52 hours worth. I saw a thing and it was like, if you watch them in this order, it'll be 52 hours and you'll be all caught up. And I'm like, no, thank you. But but there's, there's an Avengers movie coming out. And one thing I do know, even though I don't go see them all the time, one thing I do know is that the movie ends and everybody stays in the auditorium. I mean, have, have you noticed this? Have you ever been to, a, to an Avengers movie? And it's like the movie ends and everybody stays in their seat. See, normally when you go to a movie and it ends, you get up and you leave because the movie's over. So, so you go to an Avengers movie and it's weird. because And I just, the first time I went to one, I didn't know what was going on. I just stayed seated because I'm like peer pressure, right? Like, I don't want to be that, like, what's going on? You moving first? I'm not moving first. I'm not being the first one. I'm not going to be the joker, you know? So I'm like sitting there and I'm like, and, and, and I'm like, uh, Nicole, like, are we supposed to leave? Like, is this a marathon? Are they trying to get two movies for the price of one? Don't act like you've never done that before. That's like, What's going on? And, and in the Avengers movies, the movie ends and then the credits roll. But after the credits, there's always another scene. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. The movie ends, the credits roll, then there's another scene. Lazarus died, Jesus showed up, then there's another scene. Some of you are in the middle of the credits. Some of you are right in the middle of the credits. And right in the middle of the credits is when most people give up. Right in the middle of the credits is when most people get up and leave. They say, it's too late. It's done. Jesus was wrong. Jesus lied to me. I just saw the end of the movie. But Jesus is showing up at the end of the credits to let you know that that wasn't really the end. I've got an encore. i got a second closing coming for you. There's another ending The ending that you thought was the end is really only the beginning. I said that it would not end in death. You thought I meant that ending? No, no. I got a second ending. I got something else. I got an alternate ending. Some of y'all got an alternate ending coming in your life. You feel like it's already been the end. Like it's been the end of your marriage. Like it's been the end of your relationship with your children. It's been the end of your career. It's been the end of your business. But God said, I've got a second ending coming. I've got a second closing. But you got to stay through the credits. Don't give up on day three. Don't give up on day two. Don't give up on day one. Because day four is still coming. Jesus shows up on day four after the end of the story and he says, Lazarus, live again. And Lazarus gets up because Jesus always has an even though. Even though. Last thing I need you to see. Jesus has an even though. It said in verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. 
Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And I love this because Jesus had not even died and risen yet. See, you got to learn to start speaking what you know about yourself, not in a question, but in a statement. Don't speak it. He didn't say, he didn't, there's no question mark there. He didn't say, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life, period. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. They will live even though they die. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. I want to encourage somebody today who is mourning the way that things ended, that even though it's dead, it can still live. Even though it looks over, it can still live. Even though they said that it's impossible, God can still move in impossible situations. Even though it did not work in the timing that you wanted it to, God can still Move on your behalf. Even though it seems dead, even though it seems over, even though it seems bad, God can still work it for your good. God can still work it for your good. No matter what the doctors say, no matter what your bank account says, no matter what your friends say, what people's opinions say, what your enemy says, God has an even though in your life. God is still able. He is still able. I don't care how old you are. God is still able. He is still able. I don't care how many chances you've had. Two, three, four, five, six chances. I don't get it. No, you get another chance. Because God said, even if you died, I can still cause you to live. Even if it dies, it can live. And I can't can't close out today, second closing, without thinking of Luke chapter number 23. Luke chapter number 23, it says, says in verse 44, it was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two and Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last breath. See, it's no secret here that Jesus did not do what the disciples expected him to do. The disciples, even though Jesus had told them time and time and time again, Jesus said, I'm going to die, but I'm going to live again. And they're like, huh? okay, you're going to live. Got it. No, I'm going to die, but I'm going to live again. Got it. You're going to live. Cool. Cool. And the way I knew they didn't hear him was because when he actually died, they lost their minds. They lost their minds. Because sometimes God is telling you something in your life is going to go one way, and when it actually goes that way because it's not what you expected, you lose your mind. But even though Jesus did not do it in the timing that they planned, he never abandoned them. And I need you to know today that even though God has not worked in the time frame that you had for him, in the order that you had for him, in the way that you had for him, he has not abandoned you. He will never abandon you. Even when you look around and it looks like that thing is dead, he will never abandon you. It looked like they had, they had been abandoned by Jesus, but Jesus said, no, no, no. I just had, I had a better opportunity. I had an even though plan. See, you think Jesus has abandoned you. No, he has an even though plan for your life. He has a better opportunity plan for your life. He has something greater plan for your life. Because the moment before the greatest miracle that has ever happened on this earth, when Jesus rose from the dead, came the greatest disappointment. Because often right before your greatest breakthrough comes your greatest breakdown. Right before the greatest thing he has in your life comes the greatest problem. Right before the greatest miracle that the earth has ever seen when Jesus died rose again came the greatest disappointment to the disciples when they looked at him on the cross 
and he breathed his last breath, and they said, it's done. It's done. But Jesus said, even though I die, I will live. Even though I die, I will yet live. And three days later, Jesus rose again because that's what he does. Jesus brings dead things back to life. Jesus takes things that seem done and causes you to see the fulfillment and the fruit and the life that is still left in what everybody else said was dead. 